Hello there, LinkedIn family. Jonathan here from Potency.World, a revolution in girls' education from 11 to 18. So as part of this overall project, the thing that most holds women back is that they don't see themselves represented in areas that they may well have an interest in. So our discussion today is where are all the female leaders? I'm joined by such an array of women uh, entrepreneurs, business owners, and leaders from around the world that I'm not. So the question that really is the main uh, emphasis of this call, where are all the female leaders? I guess the first thing I want to know is, what does a female leader look like to the ladies on our panel? Um, Austra. Oh, um, I think for me, it's, it's, it's pretty much the first thought that came in my mind is just women in leadership position. That's or like a business owner, somebody who is in that leadership space, you know, impacting and what do you mean? So a business owner is one thing. What do you picture when you say female leadership? I would say I definitely see somebody who is confident, um, mm -hmm. but also cares about people and wants to support people that, that she's working with or leading. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not just about position or having the name of the position. And it doesn't even have to be leadership position because leadership position can be somebody who's a mom, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. you have huge impact on kids, which are our future, you know? So I think it's, it's a person who it's they are confident about themselves and within themselves because it's hard to lead when you don't have that sense of groundedness around you and in who you are but also somebody who wants to help wants to support others and not only point fingers of you have to do this or that but they're also ready to lead by example so from that i uh got a lot of sensation uh, bodily sensation, feelings, thoughts, emotion type things. Mm. Paulette, given the double uh, blow of being a woman in tech and also a woman of color in tech, we know that representation is extremely important. So how did that affect you and how did you get to where you are? Um, thank you. Um, how did it affect me? In many ways, actually. Um... You know, even the fact that I had all the necessary qualifications, I was overqualified, but not having access, mm. um, lack of representation, not being, um, having to deal with the notion um, imposter syndrome, because mm -hmm. I don't, it's, it, it doesn't apply to me because growing up as a young child, I was always told to always do my very, very best. So mm -hmm. for me, being in a space, an environment that was, unkind you know dealing with microaggression dealing with you know being victimized you know overcoming and understanding that actually you know no matter what i've got a job to do and i would always put my best foot forward but how it impacted on me really was through my mental health you know and i felt that you know that i wasn't i wasn't good enough because of how i was treated not how i felt about myself do you see what i mean you know when you're in a situation and you know you're good, but the, the, you're in a you're in, a, you're in an environment where you're like, actually, you're not good. And I'm like, I'm fighting with this environment or all the people in there. And, you know, like there was a culture of that they were better. And it was like, no, this is, un this is it, it just didn't fit. It was like a jigsaw, but it, it didn't, it was an odd piece out. So how did I deal with it? I, I what I did, I did it in, in the most um, humble way. And um, mm. I would challenge in a way where I knew I was right. But I would, I would always have evidence, evidence to back up why mm. I knew I was right. And then, and I, you know, sometimes when you're losing a battle, sometimes you just have to say, okay, then fine and move on. And because I was able to move on, that's where the opportunities I found. Because I met some really nice people. He said, Paulie, you're exceptional. And they empowered me to push forward. So sometimes you can be in a, a, a situation where you do feel unwelcome, but then you can get an opportunity to move from that and then do better. So that's how I dealt with it. I just kept pushing, really. So picking your battles, 
Um, and as is said to me on many occasions, having to prove yourself two times, three times as much as a male equivalent just to get your point to be understood. Yes, correct. Shirin, we've got a long-standing relationship, even though I haven't seen your new hair till today. What did <laughs> female <laughs> female leadership look like, feel like to you? Um, first of all, if it's okay, I want to say to Paulette, I mean, it's really interesting you bringing up the imposter syndrome situation and that that difference between the two. I knew how good I was, but the world was telling me I was not. And there was this gate or whatever that kept blocking you. And a real leader is about someone that says, okay, I've got to get creative, right? I've got to move out of where I am and I have to move around it or through it or over it whatever it takes because i know there's something else out there so i think uh, uh, the idea of what a, a leader is and and i mean there there are lots of different styles of leadership but i think they hold some really basic uh beliefs and one of that is the belief that they can do right mm. they they have a sense of what it is they want and even though the ground might not seem <laughs> uh, right, right now, they know intrinsically they're here. And I loved what you said. I had a job to do, Paulette. And that was really important. Um, and I think a real leader keeps that focus there. I have a job to do. If it doesn't matter what that job is, if you're a mother, then that job is to make sure that your children are okay and they are functional in the world right you want to prepare them for the world ahead so that they can eventually move out into the world and, and and look after themselves and bring their own children up so you have a real goal there but we have lots of goals as a leader i guess and so i i think when i think about a leader is one knowing where you want to go two having the resilience and the confidence to come back on it and and check things out and i loved what you said uh Paulette, particularly about the creator is learning to be able to respond with the evidence because actually we have to learn to work within the environment that of those that are perpetrating us or or saying to us that you can't do this well you've got to give evidence because evidence is the only way that they can sometimes understand right and so, and that's one of the biggest things that we get told as women. Well, you know, we talk like airy fairy people, right? Um, we are in this different world. Whereas, unfortunately, um, I, and I think myself quite, quite sometimes is that I I'm not always so clear. But when I am clear, boy, oh boy, there's a difference in how I approach it and the, how I say it. And, and I'm actually more able to hold my state, my emotional state, mm -hmm. um, because I know that I've got those tools and I've also got something that, that fits with my alignment of my mission. So I think a leader has to know what her remit is, has to know where she wants to go, has to look at the big picture and have that sense of, okay, there's going to be many balls in the air. How do I navigate all of those things in a way? I may not be able to do it all in the same time. Maybe I need to be able to do it, stack it up, but really find a way to, to navigate that path. And I think a leader shows resilience and uh, flexibility and the ability to adapt. I like everything you've said, and I would only notice that, again, you describe the big picture from looking out as a leader, but we're struggling at the moment to see a picture of representation, which is the problem. Uh, yeah. And that's why I'm coming back to it. We've been joined by some others in the room. I just want to throw in a quick um, story from the authority gap. So the author of the authority, of the authority gap is uh, Marianne Seacart. She's doing a TED talk this week and couldn't come on this call. But basically, there's a story in there where a woman was encouraged by her friends. They said, oh, you've written a great book. You should publish it. Definitely send it to publishers. She was really in Confused. She sent it out to 60 publishers and got nothing. And then she thought, okay, I'll do the experiment. So she set up a male version of her name uh, email and changed the name and sent it to just six. And from six, she got four immediate yeses and two constructive feedback. So Shelley, um, 
when we spoke, we ended our call and you said, oh, I don't really think I've been traumatized, but obviously I've had to fight all the way and do it all myself. So tell us a bit about that. Well, I mean, listen, I was the only female CEO top 25 in market research my entire career. And, you know, when I had the idea to migrate research from offline to online, I don't know if any of you have ever taken a survey on the internet. You taken Everyone. an online survey? Yeah. Sorry, not sorry, but I'm the mother of that invention. I was told by every male boss of mine that it was not the right time because nobody was online and I had to wait for the right time. And, you know, had I have done that, I would not be where I am today, you know, which is the mother of that invention. And, you know, it's, it's just pretty crazy. You know, when you think about the masculine, they're very linear analytic and they follow a pattern of what's been done before, very status quo. And, you know, and, and, you know, for me, it was just talking to the head of research from Procter and Gamble a very long time ago. I think it was probably 1999 and asking him when is the right time to come and talk to Procter and Gamble about migrating research from offline to online. And he said next week. And so when I came off the stage, all my bosses said, what, what, what did you talk to him about? What did you talk to him about? I said, I just asked him when is the right time? Because you all told me I had to wait for the right time. And he said next week. And so they all told me that Paul would go, John would go, Ringo would go, and Star would go. And I said, but what about Shelly? And they said, it's a boys club, and that's the right group of people to go. And I said, mm -hmm. then I'll cancel the meeting and wait for the right time. You can all wait for the right time. And of course, mm -hmm. that's when I started my own company, realizing that I'd rather be in charge and I need to be my own boss because if I'm going to wait, for men to always tell me when the right time is, I'm never gonna win. And, you know, I think waiting for permission or looking for others to tell you who you are and who you need to be is never gonna, you know, you can try to be someone some of the time, but you can never be someone else all the time. Mm -hmm. And being your authentic self, Oscar Wilde says it best, be yourself because everyone else is taken. That was my <laughs> heartbeat moment, you know, following your heart, not your head, because your head is the textbook. You're going to read what someone else already has done. And, you know, when you, you know, for me, there's two types of people, those that see what they see, which is the status quo, mm -hmm. you follow the path that everyone else has taken and those that can see what's possible. And that's scary. You know, seeing what, what hasn't been done or what you want to do, but it seems unimaginable because it's not out there. And that's risky and that's scary. And and no one else around you believes you or believes in you or tells you you can't or you shouldn't or mm -hmm. don't or that's bad or you're going to, you know, not succeed or and then you kind of think to yourself that imposter syndrome Shireen that you were talking about well I don't fit the mold well, I've never fit the mold because I don't want to wear the ugly shoes like the men with the <laughs> strings and I don't want to wear the shirt up to here I don't look good in that and and you say but but that's my predecessors and mm. that's what they've done. And you get dinged because you don't do it like them. And you kind of say, well, I'm supposed to do it like that. But then the other side, he says, but I don't like it. And then you become me and you say, well, okay, I'm going to have the new nickname chief troublemaker, which is what I gave mm. myself. So you give yourself permission to break the rules that make no sense and create the new ones. And it is scary, especially walking alone. Until you say, well, maybe others will come with you. Mm. And then you won't feel alone. And it's not as scary. And it's a hell of a lot more fun. Mm. That's the path I decided to do. And once you decide to do it, my mother always says, it's like wearing a new pair of shoes. You put on the high heels. You look different than all the other guys around you. And they pinch the first time you wear them. 
But the more you wear them, the more comfortable they get. And you get comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's the story of my life, the story of my career. And you're only um, a well-known chief troublemaker. You are a chief troublemaker. I only wear my um, high heels at the weekend, so they're still uh, they're still wearing in. What's interesting, and so I want to come to uh, Sean, I think next because we've not talked a lot. But what is really evident, and uh, Shelley and I uh, we laughed about this, is that without exception, so far, every leader female that's pushing the envelope is neurodivergent um sean (laughs) tell me about yourself and what's your perspective on where all the female leaders are um well i mean i think that female leaders i think there are many and everywhere and the challenge is the opportunities for them to lead and be um, elevated to leadership positions. Um, I think that, you know, most recently, for the majority of my career, I was working um, in predominantly female run owned companies. Most recently, I was working um, in a in a male centric industry and company. And it was really eye opening in terms of the lack of pathways and opportunities for female leaders. Um, whilst, you know, amongst my peers and my colleagues, there are many women who are leading and capable of leading, but not being given the opportunities within, um, within the workplace, um, to be elevated to that status and that sort of authority and responsibility. And I think Shelly, what you were saying about being comfortable, being uncomfortable is, is really, um, of what you need to do in order to create those pathways where they don't exist, mm-hmm. uh, particularly in companies where maybe they're not used to, um, you know, women driving that agenda, driving driving change, um, advocating for themselves and their peers. Um, I think that that's a big part of it. And it's creating those pathways where they don't exist. And within some industries, some companies, there's there's definitely less opportunity than than in others. Well, I uh, was sent uh, the McKinsey Women in the Workplace 2023 uh, reports, which collected information from 276 participating organisations employing more than 10 million people, and they surveyed over 27,000 employees and 270 HR leaders, and it ties in a bit with the authority gap. So men will promote other men 14 times as frequently as they'll promote a woman who produces the same result and the gap in this representation so a woman advocating for a member of her team will beat the beat the door down of the of the you know payment rewards department for example and ask advocate for that other person but will not do so for themselves Hmm. so well, it's the same thing that women will brag about everyone else except for themselves. Yeah. You got to brag about yourselves, just FYI. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Vicky. Uh, Vicky, not Vicky Poole, but the other Vicky. <laughs> uh, tell me about what you saw where you, because we spoke briefly, but when you were going yep. to where you wanted to be, who was there leading the way? Um, for me, you know, I'm with, I've, everyone keeps saying that I've broke the glass ceiling with what I do with space and construction, but I haven't, you know, I, I go to schools and talk to people now and there was people out there like Catherine Johnson, you know, at the beginning of the century that without her mathematician and her orbital me- mechan- mechanics, the guys would never have been in space. And you know what? I've never heard of her. Exactly. You know, and I go out and talk to people about this. And when we look at the world wars, where the men were on the front lines, who were the people keeping industry going? Who were building the houses? Who were fixing the planes when they came back? It was women. Mm. 
So when I start talking to these young girls that get laughed at when they say, I want to go and be a mechanic or I want to go and do this, I look at them and go, go on, girl, off you go. And when I wanted to go in and do construction and everything a few years ago, everyone was like, yeah, okay, whatever. So I decided, all right then, and took on a big heritage project. And it wasn't a small one. It was a multi-million pound one. And I decided to do it with a charity because, you know, let's not make things easy for myself. And I've done it with volunteers and I've reskilled the community to do it. Because, you know what, us women don't do things easily. Why go out there and get construction people to do it for you? Why not skill people to do it instead? Mm. So let's rebuild the community as we rebuild the building. What's come on from that is we've now got four heritage projects where we're rebuilding communities as we re and you know what we've got women we've got young children coming down and it's not just all about a building it's all about how we're bringing communities together how mm. we're making it a norm it doesn't matter who you are where you are what background you come from we all join together we share stories and it's that knowledge transfer that mm. is happening years ago you used to have to have mr jones the joiner and he passed it on to Mrs. Jones, and, you know, the daughter Jones and son Jones. Never happens now. And we're losing these niche skills. So let's reinvigorate it. Let's get that older individual that's 75 and 80 to sit down and tell that story to a younger individual who will then share how to go on WhatsApp and call his grandkids. <laughs> yeah. So it's all about how they organically do it together. And that way it's not pressurized. It's not in a college. It's not in a university. It's people sitting, having a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, and just discussing life and yeah. hitting down a few walls. And it's not metaphorically either. But <laughs> as me and Jonathan spoke, you know, I was diagnosed neurodiverse, but I was always the naughty kid. And I love the way Shelley said, I was called a disruptor all the way through school. And I was like, so what? So what? I'm a disruptor. I recalled it all the way through. I got, a few years ago, I got put up for disruptor of the year. And really? you know what? I embraced that and I went, hell yes. And everyone else was like, I'd be really embarrassed. Hell yes. Bring it on. <laughs> if I'm a disruptor and I've upset people, bring it on. You know what? Why don't we, I have a huge LinkedIn following. I have 350,000. Yeah. Why don't we tell stories about all the disruptors yes we share disruptor stories yes should we do it now let's, yeah let's start the disruptor chain okay oh, i'll tell you yeah. what i'll tell you what before we do we'll do that in a in a moment but i want to get vicky paul's perspectives on right, this, okay, this so far so. Jonathan, let's but tell Jonathan, disruptor can, stories can Go. i just say something i hate the word leader because a leader leads it should be an enabler or an empowerer because that person works alongside people and brings them along with them. A leader, in a definition, stands in front and barks orders. Enabler, yeah? Okay. Well, enabler or an empowerer. I'll tell you what then. Vicky Poole, you can give us your perspective. Then Dunya can give us her perspective. You can then run these stories you're going to tell. And by the time you come back to me, my background will have changed. How's that for a deal? <laughs> yeah? Well done. Yeah, you got, you've got, you've got See, a move I'm disrupting to things again. You so have. I say, no, Vicky, I always say leadership is not about age. It's about action. And it we is. all can lead. It doesn't, it's not about command and control. It's about action. Mm. No, I always say with the wolf, where, where does the wolf always go? What? In a pack. Oh. Where the wolf is in a pack, where is the leader? In the middle, isn't it? Or at the back, because he's watching everything. Ooh. He's never at the front. You're, throw yeah, you're, you're throwing uh, some interesting and unverifiable I facts. Can I quickly <laughs> just jump in? I mean, I, I just love this whole thing we're coming together. And as Vicky said, Vicky, my book's coming out tomorrow and it's called... <gasps> I'm a disruptor yeah? yeah so we're all disrupting the place because it's important that the word 
disruptor at first i was thinking oh my gosh i didn't like it but it's so significant because when we come up and we show up we come collectively yeah Yeah. we make changes that's why that name is so important so yes embrace it so what love it it is yeah it's your why it's it's what you do absolutely If, if if you're doing what you your passion is and what you want to do and it's who you are then uh-huh. what the hell what the hell because you can be you you can be authentic yeah. in your in your in your own skin and in how you look whether you know whether you feel oh you know in terms i mentioned about imposter syndrome i don't believe they exist but at the same time for me showing up and being authentic and leading okay we have to change the name being an enabler by the way i I can't change it now because i saved it as a png so i was going to do it and i know i know i I opened powerpoint i was going to change it and no i've changed everything so but well it could be activator rather i I, just okay but i like activatable well okay i'll tell you what then on the insert before each uh, video clip I'll change it from where are all the female leaders to where are all the female activators. Activators. We can't power the pack. We can't power the pack. <laughs> oh, <Yes>. Okay. <laughs> I so, like that better. as well. So what are we going like to go pack. with then? Where are, are all we the... all becoming a wolf pack now? Oh, there you go. <laughs> we're, we're a pack. We're the FQ pack. Okay. So what do you want me to put on the title? Where are all the female badasses? All right, then. Better. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Cool, I, cool, actually, cool. I actually think that's a really nice term, Shelley, because no matter what word you, you, you would pull up, because I agree with you, leader kind of doesn't really do it justice. No. It needs to be like a community sort of feel. So, yeah, badass. Go for it. Mm. I agree with that. <laughs> nice. Now, Vicky, you joined us a little bit late, so please tell uh, us what um, leadership looked like to you ah i am i've always had quite a lot of masculine characteristics i grew up (laughs) so when i was growing up i was quite influenced by a lot of the the males i was Mm. quite late born a lot of my dad's friends had already had kids a lot of my mom's friends had already had kids and i kind of got lumbered with a lot of the blokes so i have quite a lot of masculine characteristics and as I grew up, I was kind of, I felt part of Maggie Thatcher's Article 25. So does anyone here know what Article 25 is? No. 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 So if you're, if you're a girl and you're a girly girl, then you're a girl. And you, and you kind of, you, you will naturally fall into relationships with men. And if you're a guy and you're a guyly guy, then you fall into relationships naturally with a woman. Well, because I had so many characteristics, I was kind of like left to the outliers. And as I've kind of grown up, I've kind of realized that I that I don't fit in a box. I am non-binary. I don't fit into that. Mm. And because there was so little leaders or so many other people out there who could identify with what I was going through, I kind of felt like a, a little bit of a, um, a lone wolf, Han Solo sort of thing. Mm. And I figured if I was going to go into battle, I had to have all of the information. So... I would actively be an activist and I would go off and I would forage information. And then when I had the right information, I would like stand and become the immovable object, which Mm. was fine when I was speaking to my peers, but it wasn't so fine when I was speaking to my boss or the director of department. And they were like, oh my God, Vic is such a gobshite. What is going on here about? And then when I actually turned out to be right, it was someone else had given me the information and that someone else had to be a bloke. And I very quickly learned after that, that if you encourage a bloke to think like you and to have the same idea as you, then when it's his, he can't argue with your idea. (laughs) There is a... Yeah, so I made a career of doing that. I made a career of doing that. There's not a single decision um, when I worked in sales that my boss had come up with that I didn't agree with or plant in his head. <laughs> but it, it was kind of like sub, like subversive control. Mm. And um, since I left corporate, it's a case of, well, I now run my own thing. I do my own business. Mm. So then I don't need to, you know, manipulate anyone else. But then I come up against the other piece, which is the 
blokes out there expect me to be very dominant, be the leader because I run my own business, but then at the same time be subservient to them. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the other side of the coin. So most, so most of my clients are men. And I say, if you treat me like a bloke, we're going to get on fine. If you expect me to bring you a cup of tea, I'm not the person for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Sorry, Shelley. What's your business? So I run a business called Tender Response. We write public sector responses. So we do contracts. We help you find them. We help you qualify them. And then we help pull together a response. So it's sales collateral, but it's compliance sales. Mm -hmm. You probably always get the yes, right? I hope, yeah. That's, that's my gut. Is that you don't get no's? <laughs> no, no, not not often. I have a pretty high conversion rate. What I find interesting here is that absolutely every lady that's spoken so far has talked about how you have worked your way around a system which is up against you. Uh, and the creativity is amazing. Uh, Danya, do you want to join us? Uh, but, go on. But very quickly before Please. we move on, because everyone here is so, is so important and I, I want to hear everyone's story. Uh, just very quickly, a woman is disruptive, but a man is strong-willed. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I said that and I can just feel the hatred. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the hatred. It's just an understanding what's going on. And I think it's just really that we've grown up in, for 2000 years in this culture where women have been made less than. In fairness, Shirin, we'll see what happens when you ladies post this because you may well get some hatred. Um, <laughs> <She'll> bring <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, uh, Dunya, are you there? Do you want to speak on things? Um, oh. What would you like me to say? I would like you to say a little bit about what leadership looked like to you. Uh, who was a role model for you growing up? Oh, a role model. That's a very trick question. Um, I, I don't really have a role model in my life. Um, never had. And But I think I'm a little bit opposed of what you all stand for. Oh. I've, never, I've never really received um, any abuse or um, controversy as such in my role as a business leader or as a firefighter for the London Fire Brigade for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So I was always working in a very male dominant environment um, and I always got treated as a woman and respected as a woman. Uh, we we offer different qualities. We often not as physically strong. Uh, we need the men in our life. They've got different qualities. Um, and we bring different qualities to, to their lives. But yeah. when you're in a relationship or when you have weak men around you, then you're going to have to wear the trousers. You're going to have to step up. You're going to have to rip off your skirt and 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 do that male role. But when you have a real true alpha male with strong values, a real warrior that can fight, that has that male strength, but yet is really peaceful and has that ability to take care of a woman, I think it's truly beautiful. So I stand very much against that we have to stand up for our female and we need to do the male role and stuff. I'm, I'm not for that. I think together you bring a much stronger and different dynamic. Is it fair of me to say that the perception then is that um, this is about um, women leading over men? Whereas you're talking about the complementary nature of um, binary couples in this example. Um, don't know if I understand the full essence of your question, um, but a female leader in a business, there's nothing wrong with it. A no. male leader in a business, there's nothing wrong with that. If he's a shithead and a bully and a, an absolute toxic male, Mm. then yeah he's a wrong person but you get that also in a completely female dominant environment and a female leader you get exactly the same kind of so bring a really beautiful balance with emotional intelligence people and you're going to have a beautiful company you're going to have a beautiful environment the london fire brigade is definitely not one of those 
Uh, it's very toxic. Mm, it's, mm. it's got leaders in positions that they shouldn't be there. They uh, absolutely have an emotional bank account of minus 100, if that's even a scale to compare mm. it to. And uh, they've never been through any adversity. They they live still stuck in the 60s as such. Uh, but they've been promoted because they're absolutely crack at their job. And because they're working for the government, they just get promoted because it's cheaper to promote them than to get rid of them. Mm. And that's in a lot of government structures like that. But when we get stuck in that as females and and we we just continuously absorb that kind of negative I don't want to call it energy because it's going to make me sound like I'm microaggressions. I think are fairly yeah. And when you get time. when you get stuck in that environment and you don't fit in that anymore, just get out of it. Do right. You? And I just feel like the more we try and fight it, is the more energy we give it. And uh, yeah, I'm totally against that. So okay. Well, uh, well, what I what I certainly took from what you just said, and I could be wrong, so correct me if I am, um, was that there wasn't anyone that you could look at um, that had you've now fulfilled this role as a firefighter or uh, and as a business owner. There was no one for you to look at who was doing that um and it sounds like well i know uh, the other ladies in the room the london fire brigade and there was a story about uh, female surgeons in the uk there's a story about uh, police whatsapp groups basically the culture of misogyny is alive and well and um really having a, a, a quite destructive impact on many women because the barrier to their next position is then so often far too often down to your sexual favors that perpetration of power so on that downer uh, um, thank if you, you if you ever go into that kind of environment that you feel like you have to give any of someone sexual pleasures to get anywhere in life get out like yeah um, how Absolutely. strong you are, how weak can you be? Well, the, this was the thing. So the story about uh, female surgeons showed that 75% of female surgeons, so six years of so six years of degree, six years of doctor uh, extra, and another three years to become a surgeon. So we're highly qualified. 75% of them were getting told if they didn't have sex with the consultant, their career would stall. So your, your education has got nothing into it to do. You can have twenty years of education and and academic degrees. It's got nothing to do with your emotional intelligence. No. Like you can be the lawyer, you can be the doctor, you can be the barrister. It doesn't matter. Your emotional intelligence has got nothing to do with that. And that's why it makes me quite. I don't want to use the word angry, but if you find yourself as a female, good looking or not, it doesn't matter. Educated or not skinny or fat it doesn't matter if you find yourself in that position and you can't stand up for yourself you need to work on yourself if you attract those type of males in your life you need to get out and if that happens and you can't say strongly no or strongly like this is it i don't want to even face you anymore i'll just go and work somewhere else because you're just a surgeon you know how many millions of hospitals there are just move I, I, okay. I, All right. I'm well, going to well, disagree that it's easy for people to just move when they're in those high positions. And why should they uh, have to move? I mean, I'm going to be really think see, about it here. Why should someone it. have to move because someone is toxic? Why are we promoting rubbish going up? Because that's not okay. I mean, a lot of people are promoted upwards so that they, it's, it's literally that they move up and they can do less damage further up and they don't get uh, the company. I know, but you can't fight those so, systems. You can't fight a system. So yes, I agree 100% that you that the person needs to deal with their emotional self, absolutely. And they need to find a way. But if you've, if you've worked really hard, and if you look at how many doctors, even male doctors here, cannot get promoted, they cannot move, they have to move to another country. I don't think that it's relevant to say that someone has to get out mm -hmm. when they put so much investment in this in this study. Is that from one well, hospital that you're talking well. about? Is that a study from a hospital oh. or from the UK? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, it was from the UK. Yeah. The problem with the medical system is 
it's legacy and they don't take people off boards in the medical system. And so I think what we're saying here is why should the woman who is so accomplished in her business have to move when what hmm. needs to happen is that person or those doctors should be removed from this. Why are we fixing women? We should fix the system. And well, I'm, yeah, that's, that's, what, I that's, what, I that. yeah, that's what I was going to say. That's what I was going to say, Shelley, because yeah, one of the and comments. That is the biggest problem yeah. is we keep but, fixing women and yeah. not fixing the Wait. system. The system yeah. is But that's what especially. that's one of the problems I got from the end of what Dunja said. She said that basically we can't fix the system. Mm. You can. Mm. There's the roles out there. There's a national election about to come up, guys. Eliminate the assholes. You know. I mean, you just have to eliminate. I mean, why should, for someone that has studied for so long, have to, you know, deal with sexual harassment, mm. not feeling safe in an environment? Yeah. It isn't about her, her skills. It is about assholes yeah. abusing you and not feeling safe and secure yeah. in an environment, in any env environment. No one should not feel safe and secure. Period. So, Paulette, Paulette, there's two things there. Oh, no, sorry, that's Vicky. okay. It's okay. Well, I we'll go Paulette that. and then we'll go Vicky. I mean, I, I, I agree with what Don just saying to some extent. I think she mentioned about emotional intelligence, but we also got to think about social intelligence. And that is the ability to understand your own and others' actions. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we have to think about in terms of how that, that individual feels. So I'm coming as a black woman. Yeah. And I'm not going to stay in a situation and where I'm feeling uncomfortable. Okay. Because of my skin color or because of the fact that um, I'm being assessed by my, by my hair or whatever. It's, it's, and this is something that people, especially women of colour, have experienced on a daily basis. So when you mentioned about, you know, that we have to be in our particular roles and we have to not not particularly accept it, but it seems that you're going to get a lot of people going to be very upset because people are going through a difficult time. And it's not like, I don't think it's like a feminist approach where we're saying that we want to bring men down. What we're saying is recognize us and give us a voice so that we can have a say in what's happening so we can dismantle the system and rebuild back to collectively and as um vicky said is that coming together we're not saying we're going to just yeah. do this in silo it's mm. coming together yeah. men have dominated this space for a very 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 long time and we've just sat down and what we're saying is we're not doing that no more we're not saying we're going to get rid of men we're saying that you're going to hear us mm. yeah vicky yeah Oh. Um, sorry, because there's two Vickies, I put Vic, yeah. but we, we at least we have a distinction. Vic, so Shelley, I, I love what you were what you were sharing earlier about how someone can be so highly accomplished. I don't think anyone of any intelligence, of any kind of emphasis in career, should be subject to mandating or, or degrading their body or or for anything in order to be able to pursue their career. Yeah. So it, it's regardless of education regardless of standing and that there's the the second thing um we have for so long increased the age of working so you have these old farts who are very set in their ways who won't retire or die either or yeah. and uh, what well, what well, let's be honest about it yeah and these then kind of dictate who gets promoted so then if you are like them, you get promoted. So they actually enforce behaviors. Yes. So I think when you've got young companies that have a strong HR team and it's the, um, you know, put your pronouns on, explain the pronouns and like the gender equality rainbow and the fact that Adam is leaving the office on a Friday and in three weeks time, he's going to come back as Madeline and the pronouns will have to be she her because that's how they wish to be known and that to be accepted without co without kind of Shh, do you know kind of conversations around the water, water cooler that that has to happen with first getting rid of all of the old thoughts and then mandate and change and that can only happen with central change in leadership and that's not just governmental that's that's flat across the board societal yeah and and th this comes from uh so shelly you mentioned earlier as well i think we've had it once or twice again i think i think vicky might have mentioned it um nowadays you have young young women young girls afabs signed female at birth yeah you know saying oh you know i want to be an engineer an astronaut fighter pilot 
predominantly male dominated industries and it's a case of go girl go for it what do you need and we'll make sure that it happens mm -hmm. that's because there are so many people in our generation who've wanted that and have been told no right now we're old enough we're going to everyone yeah. else because yeah. we can because yeah. we don't give a shit and we're going to pave the way for the younger generation because then our sisters can achieve it and that's how we get equality okay what i'd like to do uh with your permission ladies is take shelly up on her idea of you each telling a story um, um oh gosh uh I have broken every rule in the book. So I'm a, I, I am a, a, a disruptor in every way. And I just want to go back to before because I, I, I am about conscious leadership. So I support men and women. And I don't uh. think that women are it. You know, we are the female quotient, but it's about changing the equation and closing the gaps. And I don't think it's about taking power from men to give to uh. women. We are about men and women um leading i'm just about eliminating assholes period whether they're men or women if you're a jerk i hire for passion train for skill unless you want to be a doctor a lawyer or an accountant or going to space by the way so i just applaud and i know katherine johnson and what she did you know creating the first trajectory to the moon and exactly. i think she is amazing by the way you know everyone in space is remarkable so I am all about men and women working together. Gender equality is not about men or women. It's about, you know, everyone doing the right thing. So fantastic. Um, I think that's amazing. My disruptor story. Um, I, I, I disrupt all the time. Uh, I think um, what's my disruptor story? Uh, you told me that you'd always been doing it for yourself, always the first in the room. I'll tell you my Davos story. This is a good one. This is a good Davos story. Um, we were invited. So I've created um, <clears throat> the first, I do equality lounges. I do pop-up spaces at industry conferences that are predominantly male dominated spaces. I don't like to golf. I think it's really boring. And so we were invited to the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland nine years ago. There are very few women um, at Davos. I called it the place for the 17%, only 17% have white badges, women at the world table. And so originally I called them girls lounges, the opposite of boys, girl, the opposite of club is lounge. If there's a boys club now, there's a girls lounge. So I created these things called girls lounges. And I went to a big partner and asked them to sponsor the lounge. I needed $250,000. My invitation to the World Economic Forum was, we want you to come, but you might not feel welcome. My head said, don't go. Who wants to go to a place that you're not gonna feel welcome? my heart said i have to go to change the equation and close the gender gap and so i went to a big financial institution it was a women's group at the financial institution i said would you sponsor us and they said we will only if you'll change the name we don't like girls lounge and i said have you ever heard of men object to being boys in the boys club and i said why are we stereotyping ourselves and they said it just doesn't seem serious enough at the world economic forum I said, fine, I'm going to go. I will pay for it myself. So went to the World Economic Forum, called it the Girls' Lounge, the place for the 17%. I took a little shack and put the shingle up. And all these power women at the World Economic Forum popped their head in. Some showed up. Some men came. I had the best content in the world. And that was that. Year two, Jamie Dimon came. And we... Today, nine years later, we are a double story glass house and we are standing room only. We trend top five at the World Economic Forum and we have, and we're an unbatched space so all women can come. We flood the streets of the World Economic Forum and once women started supporting women, which now we're three million women across every industry in over a hundred countries, I then evolved to the Equality Lounge, bringing men, you know, conscious leaders. I now call it the place for conscious leaders. We are pop-up spaces, over 70 at every industry conference around the world. And we have changed the equation and we are closing the gender gap. But that is a very disruptive move. 
That is um, quite a story that you've set for the other ladies to follow. Oh, it's a pity you had to go first because, um, yeah, they're all thinking, oh, no, what am I going to say? Thank you for that, Shelley. That's fantastic. Uh, the interesting, if you don't know of this, uh, the effect where we whitewash uh, women out of history, especially scientific, is called the Matilda effect. Um, so and I learned that from watching The Simpsons. But anyway, um, who would like to go next with their story about cells? Are they disrupted? Oh, Paulette, yeah, I knew you'd dive in there. I have to dash out quickly. So, Paulette Watson, I'm a global disruptor, currently leading on the Be Me um, digital inclusion to raise one million black women and girls' aspiration in STEM, AI, and Web3 related careers. And I'm disrupting up the place, um, won quite a lot of awards recently won the global caribbean awards recently won the global women entrepreneur award i've won about 15 awards and literally i want to see us close the gap collectively making sure that no one's left behind yesterday we just ran our national um stem event so the be me sustainable event and we had global leaders come and talk to young global majority women and that was awesome and it just it just resonate with me that I am contributing to society and young girls are able to see someone that look like themselves leading from the top or enabling others. Because once they can, once they see or have a role model, they will be able to empower someone else. So that's how I'm disrupting. And I'm I would love to invite you all. Let us collaborate and let us be collect, create a collective impact and disrupt together. Go, girl. Hey, Paulette, we, will you come with us to CES? We're doing a whole um AI thing. Oh, AI, yes, absolutely. I, I love AI, definitely. Let's, let's hook up, definitely. Thanks, Shelley. And thank you, everyone else. See ya. Okay, Shelley, do you need to go? Yeah, I do, but I, I want to hear everyone's stories. I feel so bad, but I'm on at nine on a broadcast. Jonathan, thank you for bringing us all together. Will you all stay connected? I'll put all your okay. details in the YouTube uh, video. Okay, everyone stay connected. You're invited to all of our lounges wherever we go. Come join us. Seriously, I'm so grateful. I just have to be on in 11 minutes, so I'm so sorry to jump out. But thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Thank this you very much. Treat. Bye. So who are we going? So we've got Paulette, we've got Shelley. Who would like to go next? There you go. Um, if you go for it, then. Me? Yes. Sorry. Wonderful. Sorry. No, that's OK. So I want to share a disruptor story that I influenced. It's not mine. Um, it is mine, kind of. So I'm I'm neurodiverse and I'm somewhere on the the LBG rainbow. And I work with lots of people who choose to be non-binary. And I completed a course about the correct use of pronouns mm -hmm. to be respectful of everybody. So it's not ladies and gentlemen, it's all persons here present. And I'm actually very passionate about this because I think when you're starting off and you're meeting somebody for the first time and you can always use their pronouns or you can ask. So you say to someone, you know, hey, Jonathan, my name's Vicky, she, her, and Jonathan can respond with their pronouns. And then that way you get to know if it's they, them, he, him, meow, it, or a, another style of pronouns. Well, I've actually taught my son to speak gender neutral. So when he meets people, he goes over to them and says, you know, my name's, my pronouns are he, him. And there was this one particular instance where he was, he was going to, to childcare and there was a, an NVQ student, uh, a teaching student, somewhere from the local college or university doing a placement in school that, that he hadn't met before. So he wanders over and says, hello, hello, miss. My name's, my pronouns are he, him. And was like, hey, this is this is me. And this person turned around and said, my name is Maxter. I, I can't remember the name, but Maxter Sam Yabbleswacky. And then it was the, oh, Maxter. So what are the pronouns are for that? And so oh, the pronouns are they, them. I said, oh, okay. So do I call you Maxter? Do I call you teacher? Or do I call you Sam? You know, for argument's sake. And the teacher overheard this conversation and asked my son about it and he was so impassioned that he explained to the teacher 
why it's so valuable to re request people's pronouns because then you can address them correctly. And this, th this child was four, very nearly five. And the long story cut short is that on the school enrollment for persons coming in for employment or for people going in from school, they've changed the sex category to pronouns because they weren't capturing people's pronouns. And this is, I mean, this is something which in today's world, you'd like to think that they'd capture rather than just the same form from like 40 years ago that hasn't been changed. And whilst it's, whilst it's my son who's instigated this change, I am so proud of the fact that he stood up against a teacher and a teaching assistant in full view of his class to demand change. How Not for himself. He? he was four at the time. Not to demand change for himself, but to demand change for others so that other people could receive and be respected in the way that is important for them. And yeah, major mum moment was going on right there. It's a beautiful story that will impact those children in the class and the adults for the rest of their lives. When there's knowledge like that it comes from the children, it's so profound that, yeah. Oh. Yeah, I, I, I've had feedback from several people where it's the, he asks for pronouns. <laughs> and he switches fluently between them. So if he's speaking to someone and their pronouns are they, them, he flips straight mm. into it. And never been prouder. Uh, well, you have never been tr prouder yet. Uh, it sounds like he's going to be a fabulous young man. Um, these stories are just brilliant, and I, uh, who wants who wants to go next? Come on, come on, Shirin, Sean. Um, I'll go next. It's fine. Uh, okay. I mean, I I don't know too many disruptive stories of myself, but I want to just say that's a beautiful story because this is this is something that's so key to me as well because as a, a pregnancy coach i really want to empower women to be able to be disruptors in the same way that you were teaching your child and then they go on because that's the knock-on effect isn't it mm. so yeah i do i um, mean i suppose as a nurse i was always a disruptor and i would always start and change new things that would be new policies that would be happening in in hospitals but one that i do remember when i first came here was uh, I just happened to work in uh, one of the private hospitals, which was uh, pretty notorious at the time. And they, they, it was like stepping backwards in time. Um, nothing really had shifted and changed. It was the same thing. And, you know, we would have a bell call us. A person would arrive every day, come in to uh, see their, their, their uh, patient, and then they would just say, yes, 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 and walk out. Yes, 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 walk out. And we would deal with the entourage of the situation where nobody would would fight them. No one would have a discussion with them that, hey, maybe, it's a, you know, a lot of our clients were getting really confused post-operatively. So I, I thought, no, 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 we've got to do something. And Paulette said something which was really important. You've got to get the stats. If you want to make change, somewhere along the line, you do need to have stats. And I made it my business to go and get the stats of all the, the surgeons, particularly of all their patients, and basically had a look at, the, at what was happening. But none of them got confused except for one particular doctor. And I thought, well, I'm going to, I'm going to speak to this person, but I, I realized that I couldn't do it just by hearsay. So I went and got all the information. And then I just quietly, one morning, he came in and I said, I want a word with you. <laughs> and of course he said, oh, oh. And he came and sat that he came and I said, look, look at all these things over here. And I look at all the reports of this and, um, and this is what I think is happening. And he looked at me and he said, how come nobody has ever told me this? <laughs> because of the nature of how things are set up and there's the hierarchy and the fear of, of you know, there's this hierarchy of different stru uh, structures. This is what happened. And I think what, what happened was I did something completely different and um, he changed. He, he basically said, well, that's got to stop. Mm and went and spoke to everybody around and, and and sort of said, why didn't you tell me? Why wasn't this happening? He spoke to the nurses, spoke to the nurses, spoke to everybody. 
And he actually changed his system and he changed the system for all these NHS patients. So it really was an interesting dynamic. I didn't see all the consequences of it, but it was really nice to know that I was that person that was able to be there and make a shift without without too much, actually, just that quiet calling in, having the information and just being very contained, I think. And I think that was where I kind of realized this is what le- for me leadership is, is to be able to hold that balance and be able to put your argument in a way that cannot be refuted um, and at the same time give grace. And that, uh, please. Yeah. No, and, that, and, and, it, and it had such an effect um, with what his practice was and then, as I said, the practice within the NHS. I would like to say, uh, as a former um, African-born lady, the understatement, the Britishness with which you've understated that enormous (laughs) impact and unwavering seeking out of facts Mm -hmm. and then cleverness to know that a man's ego needs to be massaged profound I, that's, I just think that if you actually often speak to men with the same compassion and regard and you still and you are in your in your space most educated and and, and certainly well-meaning people will respond differently i do mm. believe that mm. So I was I I was lucky I wasn't in that kind of argument stage where I have had with some others, but um, this this particular one I was just totally different and it was so interesting to see how that response was. Yeah, fabulous, fabulous. And it did have a big change. Yeah, amazing. Um, Vicky, um, no, Vic, would you like to go next or Sean? Would you like to go next? One of you has to go next. I might go next. Lovely, Sean. Well, sorry, you've not spoken much this thing, so give us a juicy story or two. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think I can deliver on a juicy story. Um, <laughs> and I think actually one that kind of came to mind for me initially is one well before I began my professional career, but back in school, um, I when I was probably about 15, I wanted to play water polo and we didn't have a women's water polo team. So I played on the men's team for um, for a year until we had a women's team. But for that year, I worked really hard. I started in more games than not. Um, and, you know, really um, tried to see myself as an equal player. And I think for me, it was a really big lesson in you know, sort of what I was talking about before, where if you don't see the pathway or the opportunity doesn't exist for you, you need to create it. And just because it's not there, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't go for it or you shouldn't try to make something happen. Um, So I think it's something for me that was like a, a quite an early lesson in that I really could carry forward throughout my life and my professional career in that just because it doesn't exist, it doesn't mean you can't create it. Um, and sometimes, a lot of times, that's what it takes is you have to you have to have that vision and be able to follow through and and make it happen because nobody else is going to necessarily do that for you. You need to be you need to be driving. So for me, that was quite an early and poignant lesson that was impactful even today. Very much so, and literally, it is growth mindset in action. Mm. May I ask you a question? I don't know if you identify as any neurodivergence, do you? I don't know. Okay. An observation I have made that may or may not be true appears to be that women, maybe because it's conditioning, it may be something uh, in the neurology, but essentially women are better than men at understanding consequence. So... Mm. Girls appear to get trained from very early on. Oh, don't do that, or, or don't do that, or, because this is, you know, it's an overprotectiveness, but it might lead to the ability to be visionary. Because everyone so far, yourself included, has 
fearlessly and with great purpose and with outcome thinking, which is an NLP technique, have gone after and changed all sorts of things. What's your thinking about that? Like, I think men are binary. I mean, I, I don't think I'm educated enough uh, on, I think it's quite a generalization to make, I, I just don't know enough to say whether or not, um, I think there's probably more nuance there um, th uh, that, yeah, I'd have to get back to you on that. I saw I'm being a bit too over over generalistic for you to make it a a, a, a call on it. Mm -hmm. So just speaking for yourself, um, are you aware of seeing things in your um, the way you plan? I think I think in terms of consequences, I I think anecdotally from what I have experienced, I think that women professionally are more aware of what they do and how that impacts them mm. whereas for the men that i've worked with maybe less so and they're more likely to take a risk or do something that might be deemed um disruptive or could potentially backfire because they also deem the consequences as less or less impactful so yes that's how i would interpret that well, that interpretation certainly lines up with the reading. So we're going to go to Vicky now, uh, who's leaving shortly. So your story, Vicky, you've already told us about how you changed the aspirations of young girls. What's your story? Um, my, I suppose I've been a disruptor since an early age. I was a very naughty child. <laughs> um, I, I was, I was a very naughty child. Um, I, I got lucky, I got sent to America. Um, I did my last few years in high school over there. And they embrace people with differences. And it's a bit unlike England, um, where we got to do electives, we got embraced, we got to be put in sports. Because I, I love the way you were talking, Sean, where they don't judge people just for being females or males. If you want to have a go at one of the male sports, they say, come on. And they give a level playing field to people. So I think very much that is what's grown me in my disruptive behaviours, as I call it, um, where they've embraced so when i came back to the uk um i carried that into the workplace um and then from there on in i was and that's why i heard what was it jandra was saying before from the fire service oh didn't now you? yeah i was a police officer when i first came back um and I understood what she was saying, where we had to put the pants on sometimes. And it was very different because it was always the females that were chucked in when there were fights or anything, because the males had this perception that females could calm a situation mm. when it was actually they were putting them in harm. <laughs> I don't know why they thought when there was a big punch up, let's chuck one of the females in there. You know, the men will stop. But when someone's in a frenzy, they don't stop. Nice. So, but it's it's just that whole perception that, you know, and sometimes it's, we had to wear the pants instead of them wearing the pants. And we had to put, we could think faster sometimes. And I think that's what I've took over into business. And when I came out of the police, I then went into basically embracing everything that I'd learned in America, which was the space education and the engineering. And that's why I said I wanted to try construction. And everywhere I opened, knocked on a door and tried to get in, everyone was like, no, you're not quite right. Mm. You don't fit this. You haven't got the right education. You haven't done this for years. You haven't got... So I decided, well, if no one's going to let me do it, then I'm going to do it for myself. And with that, I went to schools and I've embraced the whole thing. Um, I've also gone and worked with people like Airbus and stuff like that and embraced the educational routes for kids to get apprenticeships 
because that's the most important. It's about how, on a bigger scale, we change the narrative. And I loved what Vicky said, because we're peers for young people. And if we show them a negativity or how not to act, then they're going to carry on acting badly. Mm. We have to be the positive role models for them tomorrow. And we have to show them what's right and wrong and be the good person. So if we do something bad, it shows bad on them. So if we can embrace the change positively and one of the favorite sayings i have on my wall is muhammad ali is if your dreams aren't big enough um oh god i can't i'll have to look up at it it'll it's, always be the way yeah i know i know um basically muhammad ali's got i've got it up on my wall and it says um Wait there, I'll go and have a look at it now. Because it's 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 one of my favourite sayings. If you was it, say it again. It's alright. It says if your dreams aren't big enough No, I forgot I've I've, I've I've looked away at it again. You knew that, didn't you, love? Well, you know If your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. There you uh, go. Uh, like there it. you go. Like yeah. it. So basically I always try to do everything in life that scares me. Because I think that's the best way forward, stepping out of a comfort zone. And I think I've heard all the stories of everyone in here today. And I'm humbled by half the things that I've heard because I think you're all great. And I think it was right what everyone was said earlier. It's not that we're trying to battle. I think everyone has a role in life. And I'm not saying that men are the evil, they're not. Them. I work alongside men day in, day out, I and I have man. great banter with them, and they respect me, and I respect them. I think everybody has a job to do in life. It's just how we all respect each other, and I think that's what Vicky was addressing before when she was saying she was teaching a little one how mm. to do pronouns, mm. and it's all about that respect. The right person needs to do the right role. The right person needs to treat people with respect. And I think that's what it goes back to. And the further we can improve that respect straight across the board, that's what we need to do. And I fantastic. Think... Sorry. No, that's yeah. it. Well, uh, fantastic. I, I uh, know you need to make a move. What I would yeah. say to anyone watching this video on YouTube or any of these ladies' channels is their LinkedIn contact details will be in the uh, show notes. Connect with them, especially if you're a young uh, female entering the business world or whatever world, and you're looking for someone who you can ask maybe to be a mentor. Um, we've had a fantastic conversation. Um, I hope to do more of these. So see you soon, LinkedIn family.